is a, uh, a white blood cell that has been invaded, or maybe a red blood cell, I can't tell now, it's too, too, uh, too uh, late in the game to tell whether, what, kind of, uh, what kind of human cell it was. This is a, a Borrelia, a spiral-shaped bacteria that uh, is thought to be the primary cause for what's referred to in the United States as Lyme disease. One of these microbes invaded a, a perfectly healthy human cell. One of these got into a perfectly healthy human cell, divided and multiplied, made many copies of itself, and then finally ruptured the cell membrane and started releasing those microbes into the, into the environment so that those spiral-shaped bacteria could corkscrew into another cell and do the same thing again. And so this is the, uh, the nature of the, of the Borrelia, is to spread this way. <clears throat> it's called the, the second great imitator. It uh, imitates uh, many different illnesses. Uh, if you go to this website, Nutramedics.ec, that's an Ecuadorian internet site, you can look at the I think now 380 different illnesses that have been taken from the peer-reviewed medical literature showing that uh, Borrelia either mimics those illnesses or causes those illnesses. These are some of the illnesses. Multiple sclerosis, myelopathy, polyneuropathy, brain tumor, encephalopathy. This is from that journal. Meningitis, encephalitis, neuritis, mania, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, schizophrenia, anorexia, dementia, from this journal. Also cardiac diseases, cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, perimyocarditis, arrhythmias, atrioventricular block, conduction disturbances. This is from this journal. In the United States, an unofficial study was done to look at the incidence of Borrelia in patients with chronic fatigue and found to be present in 90% of them. It may be less than that for, for ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis here in the, in the United Kingdom and in, in the European Union, but, uh, but it's very high in the United States. A large percentage of patients with uh, fibromyalgia also have Borrelia as a cause. It can, ca it can cause Parkinsonism and a variety of other neurological conditions. And also a variety of diseases in children and newborn and even fetal conditions. So you see those listed there. Oh, that's better. Better? Yes. Okay, good. <coughs> So the, these Borrelia that I showed you two slides back do not usually act alone. They act in concert with other microbes. So these are called co-infections. Bartonella is a very common co-infection. Uh, probably uh, in at least 30 or 40 percent of the patients that have Borrelia, there is also Bartonella. The most common uh, Bartonella uh, that, that we see in the United States is the one that causes cat scratch fever. Okay, but there's, there's 30, 31 or 32 species of Bartonella that are known to be pathological in humans. Babesia, a protozoa very similar to the one that causes malaria, does cause night sweats usually, is very commonly present. This is a, a microbe described by Dr. Fry in the Fry Laboratory in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a, it's a protozoa called Protomyxozoa uh, rheumatica. So it affects the joints, causes inflammation in the joints. Leptospira, some other spiral-shaped bacteria are very commonly present with the Borrelia. Also the Rickettsia, Ehrlichia, and Coxiella are very commonly present. Also Mycoplasma, Mycoplasma hominis, Mycoplasma incognita fortuitum are most common. And then a variety of other infections either are come into the body at the same time as the Borrelia 
or they come or they uh, thrive in the body because the immune system is so pressed so, so suppressed because of the Borrelia because of the Bartonella this is include a variety of uh, parasites one recently described in the United States is a small roundworm that lives in the lungs uh, uh, Larry Claypow uh, described this and it's a very very difficult uh, par uh, worm parasite to try to eliminate from the lungs he found that by inhaling pure vodka that you make the bugs drunk and then when you cough they come out <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a variety of fungi. Very commonly when someone goes through treatment for Borrelia, uh, they use this, if, the, if the doctor uses standard pharmaceutical antibiotics, it kills off the friendly bacteria that live in the intestine. That causes, where's that coming from? Oh, we're t testing another one. This one works better? Is that better? Oh, that's better, yes. <laughs> Getting better all the time. Okay. <laughs> so. So if a, if a patient goes through treatment for these bacteria that, I've, that I have described with standard pharmaceutical antibiotics, very commonly that kills off the friendly bacteria in the intestine and the funguses that are in all of us overgrow and become a problem. Candida species are the most common that overgrow in the intestine, but also aspergillus in the sinuses more commonly than the gut. Uh, Penicillium and cladosporium also in the sinuses more commonly than the gut. Treponema species. Uh, most uh, practitioners don't realize that there's a variety of Treponema species living in the mouth as, as quote, normal flora. And uh, we're not talking about Treponema pallidum that causes syphilis, but we're talking about other Treponema species. And <clears throat> Dr. Judy McClossey has now uh, fairly conclusively proven that those other Treponema species in the mouth contribute significantly to dementias, Alzheimer's dementia and other dementias. I'll show that in a few minutes. Now, this, this microbe was recently described by Dr. Hal Huggins, a, D, a doctor of dental surgery in the United States. And uh, there's only four articles in the peer-reviewed literature about this bug, so it's not very, not very well known. But he found this, this microbe, this bacteria, in 14 out of 14 samples of patients that had amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, okay, this bug. Uh, that's not uh, what we call proving Koch's postulates or, or Hill's postulates, that that is a cause and effect relationship, but it's very suspicious that this bug is in, in every sample that he's tested so far. And viruses. The uh, herpes simplex viruses, one and two, that cause the uh, her, uh, fever blisters on the lips or the genital sores. Cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus type six, uh, xenotropic uh, murine leukemic virus associated or related virus, and uh, Coxsackie. And these are just a few. There's many others that sometimes will be present in the body, all adding to the problem of symptoms that the patient suffers. Now, most, most doctors think that the only way that this, that this Borrelia can be transmitted is through tick bite. But there's a lot of evidence that that's not true. There's a lot of evidence that it can be transmitted by many other routes, including mosquito bites. This is probably the most common route of transmission in, in, in Texas, other than human to human transmission through, sex, through sexual intercourse and kissing. Flea bites, as I said, sexual intercourse, blood transfusions. In the United States, none of the blood is screened for the presence of Borrelia or any of these co-infections before they're administered to the next re re recipient of the blood. Transplacental transfer from the fetus, you know, into the fetus, into the fetus from the mother. Breastfeeding, drinking unpasteurized milk. From a from an animal that's contaminated, or eating poorly cooked meats. So there, this this article here uh, from uh, from Medical Hypothesis in 2003 uh, has articles that uh, that are from the peer reviewed literature that reference that, that, that talk about these as sources of uh, of, of uh, Borrelia as an infection. Uh, there's 224 peer reviewed references in that one article. It's a very good article to look at.
most blood tests miss the diagnosis. In that same article, Dr. Harvey and, and Dr. Salvato uh, tested 400, 455 patients in their practice that had chronic fatigue and a variety of other symptoms. And only, only one third of them showed up positive on the first test for, for Borrelia. But during the course of the next year, every patient in that group was positive for Borrelia. 100% uh, of 455 patients. And these are patients in Houston, Texas, where, it, where at that time, Borrelia was not considered endemic. The, <clears throat> a, a recent laboratory that's uh, started doing testing in the United States that, states that looks very promising for finding the diagnosis is the advanced laboratories. They use a very special culturing technique that was developed by Dr. Lita Matman and they culture the microbes up and then do an immunofluorescent staining for the bugs that they find. This immunofluorescent staining is specific for the Borrelia uh, antigens. And uh, <clears throat> they don't test for any of the co-infections, only for the Borrelia, but it's, but it's a good test. The, in my experience, the, the standard uh, Western blot and uh, ELISA uh, testing miss the diagnosis at least half of the time in many cases as much as two-thirds of the time. There's another laboratory in the United States in Texas, in Lubbock, Texas, that is now testing for all the co-infections. And so it's very sensitive, uh, ultra-sensitive polymerase chain reaction, uh, testing of the, of the DNA of the Borrelia and dozens of other spirochetes and other microbes. And then you'll hear from Dr. Schwarzbach this afternoon about the Infecto Lab here in Germany. Now this is from the Center for Disease Control in the United States. And you see from this they say first we should do, if we suspect Lyme disease, we should first do uh, enzyme immunoassay or uh, immunofluorescent assay. And then if that's positive, then you go ahead with treatment and, subs and subsequent uh, titer testing. But if you're negative, what do you do? They say consider alternative diagnosis. So alternative is something other than these. The laboratories I just showed you are alternative. The advanced laboratories in the United States, the uh, Infecto Lab, uh, may be considered uh, uh, an alternative to the what's up here, the uh, the laboratory in, uh, in in Lubbock, Texas, the Spirostat, or electrodermal screening is what I often use is a, is a way to screen for what's going on with a patient. If I see evidence that a patient has uh, Borrelia or other co-infections by electro electrodermal screening, then I will say, okay, we'll need to keep looking harder with conventional testing if I want to prove this diagnosis. This is a, is a spirochete, a, a Borrelia. It, it comes on the, onto the uh, microscopic slide here in the top left corner and goes all the way across, spiral-shaped bacteria. This bacteria, two hours ago, was exposed to a pharmaceutical antibiotic. And it, that antibiotic caused the, the Borrelia to start forming these granules. Inside of these granules are enough d DNA of the Borrelia to form a new bacteria. Okay? And these granules are completely unresponsive and impervious to pharmaceutical antibiotics. These granules can persist for days, weeks, months, or years inside the body until the antibiotic is stopped. When the antibiotic is stopped, these granules become a spiral-shaped bacteria again. That's the pleomorphic nature of Borrelia. That comes from the Antimicrobial Agents in Chemotherapy, 1995, and from Infection, 1996. This boy is the reason why I became active in Lyme disease. In 2002, his grandmother brought him to a conference that I was giving, and she said, my grandson is very gravely ill with Lyme disease. He's taken the pharmaceutical antibiotics and gotten worse. What do you suggest we do? When she walked up with her grandson, I happened to be standing by the Nutramatics booth. And I said, I'm not sure, but uh, they have a herb here that's supposed to be very broad spectrum antimicrobial called Cemento. I said, let's energetically test it on your, on your grandson. So we did that right there at that moment. And energetically, it tested very good using muscle testing. So I said, it looks like this would work. And uh, when I tested the doxycycline that they brought with him, which he had been on most recently, it tested very poorly. 
So I said, I would go back to the Lyme literate physician and get his permission to stop the doxycycline and start instead the cemento and see how he does. The grandmother took her grandson to his house and she went to her house. And I later learned that without asking his parents or her or the doctor or me, the boy started on cemento and stopped the doxycycline on his own. And two weeks later, he was very much improved. And two months later, he was completely well. Even though he had gone from being an A student to an F student with the illness, he came back up to being an A student in less than two months. He, he, he became uh, bedridden during the illness, and within two months, he was back to doing sports. So this boy got my attention, and I said, that's, that's amazing. And so I started learning more about Lyme disease and, and seeing how widespread a problem it was in Texas, where this study was, where this study was done that we did. And uh, the more I learned about this illness, the more, uh, more compassion I developed for the patients that had this illness because oftentimes they were told, there's nothing wrong with you, you're crazy, you're sick in the head, uh, that, you know, there's no, that your tests are negative, uh, you know, we need to put you on a, a, a psychotropic drug uh, medication uh, to take care of your problem, there's nothing wrong with you, go home. <laughs> so anyway, when the, when the uh, grandmother, that, that, whose grandson she had brought, uh, learned how, how much improvement he had, she talked to the, the Lyme literate physician who was treating the boy. And he said, uh, it's, no, it's not possible that the cemento had that effect on your, on your grandson. Uh, it's not, there's nothing stronger than the pharmaceutical antibiotics that I already gave him to get rid of the Lyme disease. She said, no, pretty sure that the cemento is what did it. He said, I'll prove it. I'll, get, I'll send you patients that have failed antibiotic therapy, and you can put them on the stupid herb and, and see that it does not work. Okay? And so, uh, so he referred 58 patients who had failed antibiotic therapy. And over three months' time, there was a 25 to 50 percent improvement in all of those patients. Now, they weren't getting just cemento. They were getting cemento plus drainage herbals and drainage homeopathics and a change in diet and more water to drink and all these things. So you can't blame it only on cemento. Uh, and she didn't try to do that. She just said, you know, we can help these patients. So she called me up excited and she said, I want to do a, a, a clinical research study, a, 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 a control study. I said, I don't have time to re do research. I'm a clinician. She said, but I don't know anybody else to help me. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I'll, as long as you'll do all the work, I'll, I'll show up every other, every other week to evaluate the patients. And so she started the study in Dallas in 2003, the question to be answered, you know, can integrative natural medicine make a difference in advanced Lyme Borreliosis patients given no hope by conventional medical doctors? The question is not, can we find one magic bullet to get rid of Lyme disease? The question is this, can we make a difference? So you'll see we, uh, we didn't use a single modality. We, we did a lot of evaluations. We did a lot of treatments. We did a physical exam on every patient uh, every two weeks. We did uh, uh, an, a medical outcome short form questionnaire that was validated in the peer reviewed literature. Uh, we, we did symptoms, uh, symptom severity uh, questionnaire. Uh, we checked the bioterrain, the pH in, in the, of the uh, saliva and urine and the mineral uh, conductance in the, in the urine and saliva or just in the urine. We did dark field microscopy. That was very fascinating. On the first, on the first uh, specimen that we got from the patients that, that were being treated, there was, there was spiral shaped bacteria swarming the slide. Thousands on every field. Uh, on the next time, two weeks later, there was a few. Two weeks later, there was none. And we thought, wow, that's pretty fast. But the patients were still symptomatic. So we crushed the red blood cells and looked again and found a lot of bacteria that were inside the red blood cells that were released when we crushed the red blood cells. So two weeks after that, we crushed the red blood cells and there's almost none inside the red blood, seal, red, red blood cells either. Two weeks after that, there was none, period. So we saw the progressive uh, reduction of the load of the microbes in the, in the body. We did uh, energetic evaluation on every patient, every visit. Uh, we did a cell blood count, chemistry profile, western blot on the first and last visit. So these are the therapies. We, you know, again, we're not looking for a single therapy. We're trying to find out is anything collectively capable of helping these patients given no hope. 
So we changed their diet. The, how many of you are familiar with blood type diet? Yeah, okay, good. Now, uh, on the surface of red blood cells are lectins that will cross-react with uh, lectins on the surface of foods. And so if you eat the foods that are wrong for your blood type, you get sticky red blood cells. They stick together and you don't get good transport of oxygen into the tissues. So this is not a good thing for a patient that's uh, chronically infected. Also, we know that a person is much more likely to develop an allergy to a food if they eat a food that's wrong for their blood type than if they eat a food that's correct for their blood type. So we put every patient on a, on a blood type diet, <coughs> a, diet a, a, a diet appropriate for their blood type. We gave them enzymes with meals and enzymes in between meals, uh, multivitamins, uh, minerals, uh, herbs to detoxify and support all organs, homeopathics to support their, their body. The cemento was the only antimicrobial in the, in the first uh, study that we did. And then we did something to detoxify them, to drain their lymphatic system, uh, some, something to help detoxify them through their skin, uh, stretching their muscles and joints, uh, uh, encouraging them to laugh, encouraging them to uh, get quiet and still and meditate and pray, and to uh, release any emotions that they could. Now, <clears throat> we, did this, we did this last part because uh, if we got attacked by the authorities in the United States, we could always say, well, God must have done it, okay? <laughs> it wasn't our fault. Everybody was praying. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the most common adverse reaction that the patients experienced in the study, and still to this day the only significant adverse reaction that the patients experienced from the Calvin Support Program, is the Herxheimer reaction. The Herxheimer reaction is when you kill off too many microbes too fast, the carcasses of the dead microbes pile up in the tissues and create a stench in the tissues, create a poisoning in the tissues, and the patients become symptomatic with headaches, nausea, vomiting, muscle aches, joint aches, uh, and a variety of other symptoms. And so that was the, uh, the reason why all of those drainage remedies, the herbal and homeopathic drainage remedies, were so important, and drinking enough water was so important. Now, <clears throat> We, we learned during that study that, uh, that if a patient developed a Herxheimer reaction, you needed to give them drainage remedies every 10 minutes until the Herx reaction went away. Sometimes that took an hour, sometimes that took two hours, sometimes it took three hours. But in most cases, the, Her the Herxheimer reaction would not persist for days like it does when you take standard pharmaceutical antibiotics. It would go away within a few hours. So the patients were willing to continue the therapy uh, because they saw that there's a way to deal with the Herx reaction if they got it again. That's one of the problems in a lot of studies is that the patients are not compliant because they get discouraged, they feel so terrible, they say, I, I'd rather die than take the therapy. <laughs> okay, so the, so the other reactions are very rare except for the Her Herx reaction. Now these are the symptoms that were present in the patients that we, that we treated. In this study that we did, we had uh, initially 14 paired patients. The patient, in other words, 28 patients total that were paired, each, each patient was, was paired with someone that was the same sex, the same age approximately, uh, the same blood type, the same smoking history, the same degree of illness, the same, same as, uh, 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 thing, as many different things as we could think of that were paired. So uh, in, in that initial group of 14, on the very first evaluation of the, uh, that group that was going to go into the, uh, into the treatment, uh, protocol with natural therapies, we found a patient, that pa one of those patients had a tumor in the ovary. So we referred her to surgery. The sur surgery showed that it was an ovarian cancer, so she fell out of the study. The other 13 patients that were in the treatment group with natural therapies finished the study. So this is the, the reporting from those 13 patients. Uh, you know, all of them had fatigue. That's the most common symptom. A lot of them had stomach pain joint pain, memory problems, muscle pain, visual disturbances, emotional instability, uh, you know, anger, frustration, uh, sadness, uh, depression were the most common. And then peripheral neuropathy, uh, pins and needles sensation in their, in their arms and legs. Uh, insomnia was fairly common also. At 10 weeks into the study, two and a half months into the study, uh, there was uh, a significant number had improved. This is the percentage over here. So 92% uh, of the patients had improved with fatigue. 
you'll see this uh, anywhere from 75 to 100 percent improvement in each of these symptoms by the 10th week of the study. Now, the patients, if the patients were asked, what is the, what is the degree of improvement that you've experienced at 10 weeks, they, on average, they said about a 70 percent improvement in my symptoms. Now that's, that's significant because in order for a patient to acknowledge with their lips that they have improved, we know from research that was done in about 30 years ago that you have to have at least a 70% improvement in the patient. Okay, so we know that they had had at least 70% because of previous research. Now this is the evaluation by the, the doctor. The doctor that referred the 28 patients for the study evaluated all of them on a regular basis. He was continuing to treat the control group with the best allopathic drugs therapy that he knew to, to give them. And uh, he was biased, actually, against the, the effectiveness of the therapy. So, so these results, if anything, were biased in his favor, not, not in favor of the natural treatment group. So he said that uh, in, the, in his control group that one patient improved moderately. <laughs> Uh, six patients improved slightly, four patients were not changed, and three patients worsened in the control group. In the, in the uh, experimental treatment group, in the patients that got natural therapies, six, six of the patients, 46%, improved significantly, greater than 75%, 38% improved markedly, between 50% and 75% and improvement, and 25% to 50% improvement, moderate improvement in 15%. None of them were, none of them improved slightly. None of them uh, in our in our uh, natural treatment group uh, had no change, and none of them worsened. Okay, so you you know you don't have to have statistics to see that that uh, is 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 a fairly uh, drastic change between the two groups. And by the way, when we looked at the symptoms on the on the control group, they, the the patients uh, basically. Uh, had the same opinion of their own condition as the as the doctor. The, 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 we talked to the one patient that he said had improved moderately. She said, "Well, maybe slightly." <laughs> so, okay. So at 10 weeks, uh, that that's the summary. In the in the control group, uh, very little improvement. In the uh, in the uh, integrative treatment group, the natural treatment group. All 13 improved subjectively and objectively, two of them moderately, and 11, 11 of them mo uh, markedly or significantly. By the 18th week, the patients in our uh, alternative treatment group said that they uh, experienced about an eight, about a 90% improvement overall of all their symptoms. Just two case uh, presentations uh, out of that group. The, the, this first young man was about 40 years old when he uh, 30, 38 to 40 years old when he came into the study. He was, uh, well, 35 years old, sorry. Uh, and he was 100% uh, disabled. He had lost from 155 pounds of body weight, which is about uh, 70 kilos, down to 98 pounds of body weight, which is about, uh, uh, what is that, 50, 50, 45 to 50 kilos. Uh, so he was very emaciated. He looked like a prisoner of war. Uh, because the, uh, the Borrelia had affected his mo mostly his gastrointestinal tract. He had been to see 50 different specialists, including uh, two trips to the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic in the United States is considered the mecca for medical diagnosis. All of those doctors said, there is no help for you, there is no hope for you. So after treatment, the insomnia was completely overcome. The joint pain was 50% improved. His energy was 90% improved, and he had renewed hope for the future. And his family could see that he had improved. Over the next year, this young man continued the therapy that was done during the, during the treatment protocol with some additional modifications as, the, uh, as they became available. And uh, after one year, he, mo he moved from Dallas to northwestern Arizona, bought a piece of property, built a house completely by himself with his own hands, Okay, studied to become a naturopathic doctor, and now is treating patients in northwestern Arizona, and is fully recovered, and hasn't been on any kind of therapy for Lyme disease now for ten, ten years, something like that. Okay, so there is hope. Yeah. 
This is uh, another girl that was in the study. She was uh, 17 years old uh, when she came into the study, became 18 the month after the study started. And uh, she was completely dependent on her family. She was able to only walk with a walker. She had been sick since she was three years old. She had been sick for 15 out of 18 years of life. No social life. After treatment, she was able to take care of herself, walk without a walker, go out on dates, and 50 to 75% improvement in symptoms in that 18-week period. Uh, the doctors that were taking care of this girl said that she would never go to college, she would never marry, she would never have children. Okay, she went off to college within one year of the time that, no, within nine months of the time the study started. She put herself through college, worked her way through college, and finished college in three and a half years with honors. Okay, she's, she worked on her master's degree, finished that, now she's working on her PhD. She has married, and she's quite capable of having children. And she's very healthy. Okay, so after the study was uh, formally over, it, after 18 weeks, it was obvious to me that we had made a dent in, in this condition, but we hadn't cured every patient. So the patients who were willing to continue following along with me at the office came to my office and I, I would evaluate them and I would try to withdraw therapies that they were on to see if, the, the, if that therapy was important or necessary. If they got worse, I said, that one's probably necessary. If they did not change, I said, that one's probably not necessary. So over that time, I was able to eliminate some of the therapies that we were using during the, the program. The, the white ones uh, were not essential in every patient. So they did, and not every patient had to have enzymes uh, with the meals, but I did find that every patient had to have enzymes in between meals. Some patients did not have to have vitamins if they were eating a really good diet, but if they didn't eat a very good diet, they needed vitamins. Some patients didn't need the homeopathics if they were taking the, uh, the, the quantum physically imprinted Berber from Nutramedics. You know, during the study, we didn't have Berber, but right after the study, Nutramedics uh, developed the Berber. Berber is a, a Desmodium species, a, a, a shrub that grows in, uh, in Peru. It's been used for hundreds of years for detoxification, and it's been quantum physically imprinted with uh, the energies that help to detoxify the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, the lymphatics, and the, the ground matrix. So it's a, it's a, it's a multi-detox herbal. Shortly after that, they developed uh, the, uh, the, the parsley detox, which had the same capability. Now they have the trace mineral de uh, relax detox, which does the same thing. We found that uh, <coughs> the patients, uh, uh, some of the patients benefited from glutathione, some did not. So we changed that from uh, essential in everyone to non-essential in everyone. Uh, this is a device that helps to, 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 to get the lymphatic system going. What I found is that if a patient was uh, able to lie on their back on the bed and put their legs up in the air and do the motion like they're pedaling a, a pretend bicycle in the air, that they did not need the chi machine or the light beam generator or the dry skin brushing or the other lymphatic help. So that was a, a, a very simple thing to, for them to do. Uh, we found that uh, if patients uh, had emotional issues and didn't do anything about it, they remained ill. But if they did, did some work to try to resolve the subconscious toxic uh, uh, emotions, they got better much faster. If they didn't drink enough water, they didn't get well, no matter what. And uh, a lot of people drank coffee and sodas and called that water. <laughs> it doesn't work. Those are not detoxifying. And also we found out if they didn't do something to try to bind metals, uh, that they did not get better because uh, what, what I observed is that as you kill the microbes, the metal levels actually go up in the body, in the 24-hour in the, uh, urine, urine collection. And uh, what, I, what I recognized or believed was that the, the, the microbes had taken up, most likely had taken up into their bodies some of the metals and released those metals back into the, the human body when they died. So I, uh, I modified the uh, program over the next couple of years, and I got a call in, uh, in uh, the end of 2006, about three years later, 
from Dr. Horowitz in New York. Dr. Horowitz is, uh, was the uh, president of the uh, International Lyme Associated Disease Society uh, and uh, had at that time 10,000 patients with Lyme disease in his practice. And uh, he said, I have 500 patients that are not doing well on antibiotics. Do you have any suggestion? I would like to offer something to help these patients. And I said, uh, do, do you, uh, are you willing to use uh, herbals? He said, yes, I am. I said, uh, do, you, do you know energy medicine? He says, no. I said, are you willing to learn energy medicine? He said, no. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, some doctors in New York who've used energy medicine have lost their licenses. I said, that's a good reason. He said, can you design me a, an empiric protocol that I can use that will help most patients so that I don't have to try to you know, do energy medicine? I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of doing energy medicine. I said, okay, I'll develop empiric protocol. So that's what I did for him. And uh, he started uh, several hundred patients on that uh, protocol. And I think uh, in, uh, in the fall of that year, he presented his results to the International Lyme Associated Disease uh, Conference as in the fall of 2007. Uh, and you can see that protocol on that, on that website, nutramedics.ec, as it's been modified a little bit since then. Now, uh, <clears throat> so, I think he, he reported on 70 some odd patients at that uh, fall meeting that year, but after that he did quite a few more. But 70% of those patients improved fairly quickly uh, when they were on that uh, herbal protocol, even though they had completely failed pharmaceutical antibiotic therapy. Yeah, there he presented that. So uh, when he called me and told me he had a 70% success rate, I said, well, that means you have a 30% failure rate. <laughs> He says, well, I didn't look at, look at it that way. I says, well, wh wh what are you going to do about the 30%? He said, I don't know. I said, well, I will come to your office and we will evaluate some of the patients in the 30% and see if we can help some of them. So I did that. And uh, we found you know, that they were uh, not drinking enough water, was the most common problem. Uh, most of them had mercury fillings in their teeth, which they'd done nothing about. And that was a, a, a challenge, a problem. And, uh, and a few other things. So, as a result of that evaluation, we modified the, or I modified the protocol, and uh, he put another several hundred, several hundred patients on the new protocol, and he found that 85% of the patients improved fairly significantly with the new empiric herbal protocol, which is what uh, Nutramedics offers now. So in summary, the, the, the Lyme protocol is uh, first three days taking uh, Berber, which is a detoxification herbal, uh, or parsley, which is another detoxification herbal, or the uh, trace mineral relax detox, which I didn't put up there, but it's another choice that the Nutramax has. And this, it's, a, it's a very good choice because the patients usually don't develop an allergy to, to that because there's no phenolics in it. Okay, so it's a, it's a mineral product that's been quantum physically imprinted. So it's called Trace Mineral Detox Relax. I think I have that on another slide. Pinella is a product that's been used in, in, uh, in uh, Peru for several hundred years also to detoxify the body, but mostly detoxify the brain and the spine and the nerves. So they take only those detox products for the first three days. On the fourth day, they add several things. Serapeptase. A serapeptase is a proteolytic enzyme that they take 30 minutes before food with water to digest the fibrin that's inside uh, the body covering over microbes. So when the body uh, is exposed to microbes, it causes the body to produce fibrin. Fibrin will cover over the microbe trying to wall off the microbe from, from harming the body. But in doing so, the fibrin hides the microbe from the immune system. So this fibrin covered microbe looks like self. When the serapeptase strips the fibrin off, then it see, the, the immune system can see the microbe and remove and destroy the microbe. In addition, the fibrin will, will coat the inside of the wall of the blood vessel. So if this is a capillary and fibrin is coating the inside wall, the oxygen inside the red blood cells cannot go through the wall of the capillary into the tissues very efficiently. It will sometimes decrease the, the oxygen transport time from five seconds to five minutes, 60-fold 
prolongation of the transport time of oxygen into the tissues. We also on the fourth day add uh, magnesium malate. Uh, essentially every patient that, that we evaluated uh, in the LIME study as well as the subsequent follow-up uh, before Dr. Horowitz started his uh, treatment of uh, his uh, several hundred patients had magnesium deficiency. Without magnesium, you cannot uh, produce energy, ATP energy for the cell. So magnesium is required for 50% for of the metabolic enzymes. Also, if you're deficient in magnesium, you can't get proper nerve conduction, muscle contraction, many other things are, are not working if, if magnesium is not present. Magnesium is wasted through the kidneys into the toilet in any patient that's under stress. That doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether it's emotional stress or microbiological stress or chemical stress or electromagnetic stress, any stress will waste magnesium through the, through the kidneys into the toilet. And so in order to replenish that, you must be taking magnesium uh, orally or intravenously or intramuscularly. The banderol is started on the fourth day at one drop. The uh, cemento is started on the first day at one drop. And the sparga is started on the fourth day. Now the, the sparga is a, uh, an asparagus extract that has the quantum physical imprint of the sulfa antibiotics and the other sulfa drugs, the sulfa di diuretic medications and the sulfa diabetic medications. The reason we found out that is important is because about 30% of the population that's chronically ill have the inability to properly process sulfur drugs. And so those sulfur-containing drugs build up in the tissues and block the body's ability to produce glutathione and therefore to detoxify other toxins from the body. So if sulfa drugs are present in the body, either from having ingested them or from having gotten the sulfa drug in through the shower water or the bath water, which is the most common way that people get it in the United States, the sulfa drug that's in the body will block the body's ability to detoxify. On the fourth day, we also added the, the, the zeolite plane. Now, the zeolite plane is a, uh, a volcanic clay that has, uh, is bubbled up through uh, water and uh, has um, uh, the quantum physical imprints of only a few heavy metals, of lead, of aluminum, of uh, nickel, nickel yeah, and cadmium. I think those are the four. But uh, <clears throat> if you start moving some of the heavy metals out by a homeopathic type effect, then the patients can start getting unloaded a little bit and actually start doing better. On the 49th day of the treatment program, the patient is switched from zeolite plane to zeolite HP. Chemically, the two are identical. Quantum physically, they're very different because the zeolite HP has the quantum physical imprints of all those heavy metals I just mentioned, plus mercury and arsenic and antimony and uh, you know, some of the radioactive substances and so on. On the 78th day of the protocol, the patient's been on the full dose banderol and the, uh, and the full dose uh, cemento for that period of time. The reason that those two are given is, is because the banderol will help to, uh, to eliminate the funguses that have built up in the gut and in the sinuses of the patients that have been on pharmaceutical antibiotics before. And uh, the cemento helps to modulate the immune system. So instead of giving a very strong, positive, uh, immune-boosting reaction from, from the uh, banderol, if you give cemento with that, the immune system is, is modulated so that it's not overactive, so you don't go into as much of an autoimmune or hyperreactive immune state. But on the 78th day, uh, this uh, mora, which is a, a combination of, uh, of herbals for uh, uh, you know, helping to get rid of some of the uh, Babesia and some of the other microbes is added, alternating with Enula. Also on the 78th day, uh, these start uh, rotating, uh, you know, cycling uh, Cemento to Kamanda to Hutunia. Um, this is something important to point out here. I found out in the, in the three years between the first Lyme study in Dallas and uh, when Dr. Horowitz started his study that if the patients were given uh, the antimicrobial herbs continuously, 
They got better for a time. As soon as you stopped the herbs, they got worse again. But if you gave the patients a, a cyclical therapy where they were taking the antimicrobial herbals for 12 and a half days on, and then 36 hours off, and then 12 and a half days on, and then 36 hours off, and then 12 and a half days on, on a continuous basis like on a non-continuous basis like that, the uh, the patients would have uh, when you finally stop the antibiotics, the patients would stay well. And what I uh, what I concluded from that is that during the 36-hour period that the antimicrobials are not being given, the the, the granular form, the L form, the uh, cyst form, the spore form, all the different forms of, of the Borrelia would transform back into the spirochetal form. The spirochetal form is very vulnerable to treatment, either from herbals or from antibiotics. And so the staying off for 36 hours was very important so that the bugs would come out of hiding and start playing again, start invading cells or trying to. And then when they uh, were least expecting it, we'd hit them again with antimicrobial herbals. And so by doing a cyclical therapy like that, the, the load of microbes has progressively decreased. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one drop to 30 drops of Banderol. Yes. But then when you switch from Banderol tomorrow, you're doing 60 drops. No. When you, when you go to, uh, when you go, th this is Banderol 30 drops twice per day. That's twice per day. Yeah, and this is, this is, all these are 30 drops twice per day, so it's 60 drops per day. Okay, but you start with one drop? And start with one drop twice a day, yeah, and you build up to 30 drops twice a day. Yeah. And the same thing for cemento and the same, but you know, you know those two are, are, are built up. The cemento and the banderol are built up to try to minimize the Her Herxheimer reaction. So you don't just jump on to 30 drops twice a day the first day, otherwise the patients have a terrible experience and don't really want to go back on the protocol again. Uh, but once you've built up on those two, I've, I've found that in most cases the patients can actually switch from full dose banderol to full dose com commando without uh, without building up on Commando, or full dose uh, Banderol to full dose Hatunia, without building up on Hatunia, and so on. Any other questions on that? Yes, ma'am. Well, not directly, but you've used the terminology uh, num a number of times that I'm not familiar with. You've been talking about quantum physical imprint yes. quite a bit, and, and I'd like to know what that means. Okay, uh, I could tell you how the quantum physical imprinting process is done, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, okay, uh, the, uh, the, the company uh, has, a, has a, a Russian researcher who's developed a technique to actually put into uh, the liquid herbals uh, the energies that represent the homeopathic equivalent. Okay, so these these herbals work herbally and chemically, like you would expect, but they also work like a homeopathic at the same time. Okay? Uh, these, uh, I can't tell. I think those are fluorescent lights up there, but I can't be sure. But if that's a fluorescent light up there in that long string there, uh, that is a plasma tube. Okay? Uh, when, you, when you excite gases inside of a plasma tube, it emits an energy. If the, the electricity that's going into the end of the plasma tube is pulsed rather than continuous, then whatever the pulsing rate is comes into the liquid media that's right outside that tube. Okay, so I can tell you that much without killing you. Okay? <laughs> but you wouldn't do it with neon. <laughs> it's a bad choice. You need different types of gases. Okay, so, so the, the basic... Uh, one second. The basic program is, is 190 days, uh, and that is, you can do a printout from Nutramedics.ec for that 190 day dose by dose regimen. But most patients make the mistake of not also printing out the two page summary. On the two page summary it says, if you get Herxheimer reaction, do this. If you get anxiety, do this. If you get depression, do this. If you get insomnia, do this. And so they call, call up uh, oftentimes to the Nutramax office and say, I got one of these things, what do I do? Did you read the summary? What summary? <laughs> so make sure that every patient that's gonna get the program gets the summary also and reads the summary and understands what to do that it talks about in the summary. You had a question? Yes, um, do we understand well that uh, from 
day 78 onwards, you combine some Mento and Banderol, you combine Mora and Cucumanda, yeah. and after that, and you combine Anula and Utinia after that. Yeah, so it, what, what we're doing in the days after the 78th day is 12 and a half days on one pair of antimicrobials, off 36 hours, on 12 and a half days of a different pair of antimicrobials, off 36 hours, on 12 and a half days of a third pair of antimicrobials, off 36 hours, and then 12 and a half days back onto the first pair, and keep that pro rotational process going up. Actually, in, in, in most cases, you can actually just use uh, two different pairs alternating back and forth, it works well. What I've found, though, is that there's enough different uh, species of, of these uh, Borrelia and co-infections that it's very good to have a variety of antimicrobials because you'll have a better chance of getting rid of whatever special bug that person has. Maybe they have a leptospira that you, that you need to try to get rid of and you don't, you know, if you just used one pair of drugs, one pair of herbs, you wouldn't get it. Okay. Okay, so this is our break point. Uh, but you can see, you know, there's the uh, same thing over there on the, on the side. But, you know, these are the products that are, that are used during that uh, six-month month program. Now, the, the first time we did this, how many bottles were there all together? 17. So, so it used to be 17, now it's down to 14. Uh, it used to be seven dosings per day, eight dosings per day. Now it's down to four dosings per day. You know, so the, it, the program is still uh, not terribly simple for someone to follow, but it's much more simple than it used to be before we modified it. Uh, but if, if the patient has that, has that 190 day, this one, 190 day printout from uh, Nutramedics.ec, they know exactly what to take, exactly what time of the day, every day. So they look at the sheet, take what it says, check mark that, it, that they took it. Then later in the day, see what they're supposed to take, take it out, take it, check mark it. So they, if they'll do it that way, usually they don't miss doses and they have a great success. Okay? So I think Dr. Schwarzbach is gonna speak next, yeah? Okay. So let me switch to his uh, presentation. Any other questions before I get down? Yes, ma'am. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, the, and, not every, and not every species of, of uh, uh, Bart, Bartonella does, uh, does this program work, but in, in the vast majority of species of, of Bartonella, this program works. Now, uh, we know that the Comanda has fairly good anti-Bartonella effects. The Bandrol has fairly good anti-Bartonella effects. The Hotunia has fairly good anti-Bartonella effects. And uh, <clears throat> we, there, there's other products that the Nutramax company has if you have a, 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 a tough bug, a resistant bug. Sometimes we've also found that, uh, that all that's necessary when the patient's uh, still struggling with a bug is to go for a short time, maybe for a month, on much higher doses. So you go from 30 drops twice a day to either 60 or 90 drops twice a day, only for a month, maybe six weeks at the most. In many cases, that's enough. You just didn't have enough high enough concentration of the antimicrobial to get rid of the bug. Now, uh, you know, as time goes on, the, the Nutramedics will be developing additional antimicrobials to try to deal with the, the ones that are resistant, the tough ones. Okay? So it doesn't work in 100% of the patients. It works in a, according to the people that have evaluated it about, about 80 or 85% of the time. It works well. But then that means that there's you know, 15 or maybe even 20% that it doesn't work as well, and we need to find something else to help. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. This goes back to a little earlier in your talk when you were talking about various studies that you have done, and you referred to uh, patients who have been resistant to antibiotic treatment who have been failures. Right. Well, what were your criteria for establishing the fact that they were failures on antibiotics? That, that was the opinion of the doctors that referred, and they said, you know, we've, we've tried every antibiotic that we can think of. Uh, you know, either they have negative reactions or they have no reaction. 
uh, but they're not improving. Uh, so the length of time that was, uh, yeah, and, and it, that was also up to the referring physicians. So sometimes it was only a few, only a few weeks, in, in which case, obviously, that might not be a sufficient trial uh, with these bugs. Uh, but in most cases, it was for several months that they've been tried on antibiotics before they were considered failed antibiotic therapy. Now, the, the nice thing about the, uh, the Calvin Support Program is you don't even have to have a, uh, a, a, a Lyme diagnosis for this to work. If you have a patient with a, a mysterious illness of, un, of a, an unknown cause, it's oftentimes very worthwhile to put them on the program and see if they get better. And if they get better, you don't know what they had and they don't know what they had, but they're better and they're happy and you're happy. Okay, so, so oftentimes that's what uh, the patients will even do. In the United States, oftentimes the patients get completely frustrated with the medical system and they go out on their own, find this program on the internet, buy the program from the Nutramax company in Florida, start the program and get better themselves even though every doctor they've seen up to that point couldn't help them. And they're doing it on their own. I, I don't like to do it that way. I prefer that there be a physician involved in the, in the loop somewhere so that the patient's not just uh, you know, flying, flying on their own. It's better to have a health practitioner have you involved. Have ever considered just selling the products only to healthcare practitioners? Like many of the products are like that. The patient can't buy it directly. Yeah, I don't know how it's going to be done here in Europe. Uh, you know, they started out, uh, I think, considering that in the beginning, but uh, there, there was so, so, uh, so, so much rigid thinking of the doctors in the United States. They said, well, no, there's nothing that is, good, is as good as the pharmaceutical antibiotics that we're already using. Why would we even consider uh, these, uh, these flimsy herbals? Okay. Thank you. Oh, one more. Uh, I was uh, hearing, uh, because in my practice, I, uh, when I uh, treat patients, then uh, I am doing uh, the, the woman, but also the man. One is not sick with cold because it is uh, of the yeah, They can be infected by their spouse. That I'm not hearing from you that uh, when one patient, not the department, also. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the, 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 the sexual partner or the marital partner uh, uh, oftentimes does have the same microbes, uh, and it's not a bad idea at all if the pay, if the partner is willing to treat the partner at the same time with the same program so that once the, the, the client, the patient, is free of disease, hopefully the partner does not reinfect the client. It's, it's interesting to me with, uh, with Borrelia, and maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Nicholas or Dr. Schwarzbach will comment on this, but uh, a large percentage of people have Borrelia in their body, but not everybody is sick from it, okay? My personal belief is that it's the, it's the sum total load on the body that finally creates the illness. It's the, uh, the heavy metal load, the pesticide load, the electromagnetic uh, frequency exposure, the uh, emotional load, uh, all these things added together. And then finally, all those together, along with the presence of the microbes, is enough to create symptoms. But without that whole load present, the patients can have the, these bugs living in their body peaceably for a long time. Uh, the, the first boy that I showed you probably had the bug in his body before he developed the illness uh, for, for some years. But uh, he went through, uh, in a very short period of time, uh, a, the, the, the a se severely emotionally painful separation from his very first girlfriend and a flu illness within just a, a couple of weeks' time. So it crashed his immune system and that was enough to create the symptoms and the Borrelia uh, got ahead of him. Yes. Quick question. Um, I missed the bit in the beginning. You mentioned parsley. Yeah. Is that the same as the trace mineral? Well, yeah, the, the, the Berber yeah. and the parsley detox yeah. and the trace mineral relax detox all have a similar effect on uh, detoxing the body, uh, you know, during a Herx reaction or, or otherwise, uh, because all three of those will help to detoxify the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, the lymphatic system, and the ground matrix. Now, the Detox Relax also has the advantage of, of calming the nervous system. And people that are really anxious, you know, you use more of that and less of the others. Uh, if they have trouble with sleeping, you can use more of that and less of the others. Okay, because the others don't have the, the energies for also relaxing. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Calvin. He'll be back uh, later on in the afternoon to to uh, give us some more information and wrap us up.